Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for another one of our webinars in our series for uh, CNU's Highways to Boulevards initiative. Um, I'm Alex McKegg, CNU Program Manager. Uh, today's webinar, Network-Based Solutions, is brought to us by a generous grant from the Ford Foundation. So as always, if you have any questions during today's webinar, please use the chat feature in the lower right of your screen. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the hour. So, um, the highway era emphasized free-flowing mobility uh, for the automobile over other considerations like the needs for needs of pedestrians, cyclists, and other modes of transportation. Um, this thinking sort of came at the expense of the quality of life uh, and environment and commercial success of our cities. And many of us experience this every day um, in our commutes to work or home. Luckily, uh, we're climbing out of this highway era. So considerations of livability are upending conventional thinking. Uh, transportation professionals, urban designers, and others are reconsidering the cumulative benefits of a well-balanced street network. These benefits and their applicability are what, um, uh, or the applicability to highway removal campaigns are what we're going to discuss today. So with us, uh, Dr. Eric Dumbaugh, Director of the School of Urban and Regional Planning at Florida Atlantic University and an Associate Professor uh, is joining us. Um, his research areas include uh, street and community design, urban mobility, and the effects of transportation investments on sustainability and livability. But first, we're going to hear from Marcy McAnally, founder and principal of Herb, Herb's Works, a Portland-based design firm and respected architect and planner. Mark, Marcy is co-chair of CNU's Project for Transportation Reform, and in 2012, she co-authored the CNU Sustainable Street Network Principles book, aptly nicknamed The Blue Book. So, Marcy, you're up. Okay, can hear people hear me now? Yes, okay. Uh, and can people see the slides? Yes, people can see the slides. Great, okay. So I'm going to talk about the network-based solutions using the uh, Blue Book as an illustration about what we've done in Portland, Oregon, where I have uh, lived and worked for most of my life, except I'm loud and distorted. Um, okay, let's get this fixed. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Maybe if I lower my speaker volume, does that work better? Is that better, people? Yes. Okay. Maybe we have this working now. Thanks for bearing with me. And let me know if there's anything else that isn't um, working for you, and we'll try to adjust it. Okay, so I wanted to talk about Portland, where I was talking, I was saying, I have lived for most of my life, except for some time in um, New York City in the early part of my architecture career, and going to school in Eugene. I have really been in Portland for all these decades, and uh, I've spent much of my recent career, like the last two and a half, working in Portland. 
So I want to talk about how Portland's removed our riverfront free freeway back in 1974 and uh, relied on the street network to handle traffic, grow the transportation choices for both the city and the region, restore street vitality, and become the center, the economic center of the region. There is a little bit of this story already on CNE's website for your information. I've just included a uh, view of that page. So um, it's good to look at old newspaper clippings from this era because it helps me remember that um, while I was just in high school during that time, Harbor Drive was uh, a I-99, it was our 99W. It was the beginning of the state highway and it had been placed right between the river and the downtown. And it was controlled by our Oregon Department of Transportation, as it still is and then increased in size and separated, grade separated over the decades since it was built in the 40s and becoming more and more of a barrier. And um, we certainly weren't immune to the uh, pressures of the time. We had Robert Moses inspired efforts and we had actually had Robert Moses come to town and provide some help. And we had access to easy federal money just like every other city in the country did, and uh, it allowed us to spend a lot of money on freeways, but in this one instance, uh, during this one decade, young politicians and activists were aware that Oregon Depart Department of Transportation was going to increase the size of this barrier between the river and the downtown, and they protested. And uh, we had a friendly mayor and governor at the time, and we were actually able to remove this dead freeway back in the 70s, and it was one of the first cities in the, in the United States that ever did this. And I want to talk about the things that we were able to do because we removed it. So in this uh, editorial, which you can see, it was placed in the, on the front page of the paper the day that destruction of the freeway was going to begin. And it says that uh, it will that the freeway had acted as a barrier to pedestrians wishing to walk along the riverbank. That will be easier now. Traffic will be rerouted onto Southwest Front Avenue, which is the street that is just adjacent. But motorists are encouraged to seek alternatives to the street a half block away. And then, unfortunately, this image doesn't come up, but let me just read to you from the additional editorial. It said that um, the people have recaptured the river in downtown Portland after more than a century. So this was actually from the editorial board the day of the destruction beginning. They said, let's never let it go, meaning our river. The closure of Harbor Drive will cause considerable traffic dislocation and probably at least for a time, traffic confusion and inconvenience. But in the long view, it is the thing to do. Uh, a lot of people, let me just go back to this slide for a moment uh, while I talk a little bit more about this period in history. Uh, this, there was a unique political situation in Portland at the time, and probably largely brought by young people who were very interested in changing the way that Portland grew. And uh, this is kind of Portland's creation myth that we removed our freeway, we changed the future of our downtown, and everything was better after that, and it's not quite that simple. Just um, for those of you who might think that Portland is perfect, we were still building freeways elsewhere in the city, but we did manage to get this one segment of our freeway system off the river, and it did allow us to change the future of our downtown, and, and I'm going to talk about all the other things that came along with that. Okay, so it was because of our street network that we were able to do this. And our, we have kind of a famous street network. Um, this Portland 200 by 200 foot block, which is originally laid out on the west side. I'm going to see if I can get a tool to point with. On the west side here, well, okay, over here, you can, can you see the hand pointing people? Okay, 
This is the west side. It's hemmed in by hills and the river. And this is where the central city or the downtown business district was first laid out in the 1800s. And the 200 by 200 foot block was wisely selected because it provided frontage and value for every lot that faced the street. And this network has served us really well over the years. And it is partly why removing the freeway was so easy for us to do. The east side of the river is uh, very flat uh, and has some interruptions by buttes, which you can see in some of the um, uh, irregularities in the grid. But otherwise, it's a very easy to serve uh, by transit. And it was originally served by streetcar, a very robust network of streetcar that linked people to the downtown business district. So this is Portland's riverfront today. And it's now the center of the city. And the city is the center of the region. And if you can imagine what this was like in the 50s and 60s before the freeway was there, it was a big, um, great separated freeway. And now it's the center of the region. It's also where we hold our annual Rose Festival. And pretty much in the summertime, it's, um, it has a festival in it that serves the region and really the state of Oregon every single weekend. It's primarily a place for people now. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit when I talk about the network principles. Because I think that this, uh, what's happened in Portland is a perfect uh, picture of the network principles at work. When Alex talked about the Blue Book, this is what he was talking about. This is available on the website at CNU. And I want to go through some of the principles and talk specifically about how those have been manifested in Portland. So one of the first principles is how we've talked about how Portland reclaimed its riverfront for people. And one of the first principles is about streets are not just about transportation and infra infrastructure, but also about the movement of people, goods, ideas, and wealth. They foster economic activity and provide public space for human interaction. And one of the ideas in Portland was that the street space is owned by everybody and should be usable by everyone, no matter what mode of traffic you are um, using at that time. Another principle is the one that states that all people, hang on a second here. Let me go back. It's, it's the principle that's primarily articulating how important mode choice is. All people should be able to travel within their community in a safe, dignified, and efficient manner. Each mode is integrated as appropriate within each street. And this statement was written specifically in response to the Complete Streets movement to uh, help foster the idea that uh, not every street must be complete, but the network must be complete. Every mode must be integrated into the network, but that um, needs to be as appropriate given the scale and the context of that street. And so let me talk about what we were able to do in Portland once we'd removed the freeway from the riverfront. At about the same time, we established a tri-county regional transportation transit agency called TriMet that served the entire region. And its first focus was the downtown, as again, um, part of the whole movement, which took place in the 70s, was a recognition that we needed to reinvest in our central city and uh, make it this economic engine of the entire region. Transit needed to serve it primarily and outline and bring um, commuters in from the suburbanizing areas, but give them a transit choice. So we were, like most other cities, still uh, operating a downtown that was primarily a 9 to 5, where people came from outer suburban areas to work in the city and then went away again. But we were trying to change the balance to uh, a system that could people could use 
transit to get there. And we have over time added, as you probably aware, light rail was one of our first um, transit modes added after bus. And we added later streetcar. And we now have a robust streetcar network that links the east side and the west side. We have um, quite a lot of bike networks, including everything from cycle tracks, bike boulevards, especially within the residential areas on the east side that link people to the bridges in, into the downtown, uh, and lots and lots of bike parking downtown, so that what it feels like to ride a bicycle in Portland is that it's a privilege. It's not just a right. So there are a lot of amenities for bicyclists that have made bicycling a very important part of our transportation. And uh, finally, we have, the, although it's probably not the end of our transportation adventures, we have an aerial tram that's linking to the south part, portion of the downtown. It's linking uh, a new employment area to uh, ex existing one on the hill, the Oregon Health Sciences University. And in my experience in Portland, if you build these other options for transportation, people will use them. This is a little Facebook post from my friend Greg Graceman, who uh, tracks these things in Portland. And uh, he was commenting that even in Portland with our rain and windy days, sometimes record breaking, we still get record numbers of people commuting in on the Hawthorne Bridge, as shown here, uh, to Portland uh, instead of driving. Now, all of this, it's important to notice, or to note, that all of this went along with a pretty sophisticated transportation demand management program for the downtown and uh, some limits on the amounts of parking that developers could provide. Um, and it's also translated into a transportation system for the entire region through our and three counties meaning that we now share federal dollars for transportation uh, with our neighboring cities and towns. And we uh, stage those transportation improvements so that they serve the entire region. We just finished building, or we are in the process of finishing the new light rail line that connects Milwaukee, Oregon, sorry, Milwaukee, Oregon, to uh, Portland. And When we started with our focus as downtown, we now are trying to link more of the outline suburban towns and main streets to each other. So one of the other principles that we have is how street networks support economic activity. We say specifically in the Blue Book that street networks provide a, a template for a rich combination of housing, shopping, and transportation choices. Uh, and that they are magnets for business, light industry, jobs, and economic uh, activity. And it looks like another gigantic file, unfortunately. This was the Metro Regional Growth Map, which I was going to show you. I'll just go back to this one in order to explain to you that uh, our regional land use plan, which again is um, governed partly through all, co all cities and county's cooperative efforts through Metro, our regional government, has focused activity, land use, mixed use, zoning amendments, and uh, things like that into the town centers of the historic towns and main streets that exist throughout the region. So all the way over here, for instance, in Hillsborough, where we have some of our uh, greatest concentration of high-tech employment, that was one of the first uh, employment air centers that we linked uh, with transit. It was the second light rail line that was created. And Hillsborough itself consists of a number of traditional main streets and a downtown. And those have been uh, bolstered with mixed use zoning and zoning that allows a range of housing types uh, over the last several decades so that um, each of these is not only served by a robust transportation network, but also by concentrated 
uh, choices for employment and housing within those local areas. So the last uh, network principle I want to talk about is actually two of them in, in, a, in pair that work together. One is about respecting the natural, existing natural and built environments. Uh, and that we talk about that being done both in the way that the streets are laid out, but also in the design of the streets themselves. And when we were conceiving of this principle, uh, when we were illustrating and writing the blue book, we tried to um, draw it in these diagrams. A lot of this is about um, creating a legible system of street network within the region and linking views and natural features to each other, both through a physical connection, such as radial streets, and also through visual connections, uh, so that um, terminated vistas and natural features can actually be used to orient people within the, the region or within the local con lo location. And uh, that the streets, some of them are best laid out streets, are uh, now, because of functional classification and the kind of the normalization of all of these streets, losing that identity and that visual connection between points. So the network principle is trying to inspire us to recapture some of that legibility that's found in many of these good network systems in cities, American cities. For instance, we just got back from Buffalo, and it's uh, Buffalo, New York, where we held our annual Congress, and they have a really beautiful radial system, but they placed their convention center right downtown on the uh, one of the important radial streets that connects to the very, very center. It's an unfortunate uh, intervention that was placed on the radial street in the in the 60s, I believe. That, that um, connection or legibility principle is paired with the one about integrating the street network with natural systems at all scales. And we talk in the blue book about enhancing the natural features and ecological systems of the urban environment through the street network. That you can in integrate stormwater treatment into the street design, and you can incorporate stormwater flow and wildlife habitat zones into the street network. And in Portland, this has been a very, very big part of our reclaiming our riverfront in the early 70s, removing that freeway, and now reclaiming the river edge uh, as a natural space. The Willamette River is very important to the wet watershed of um, the Willamette Valley, and it's also um, endangered species habitat, so we have a federal responsibility to manage it well. And removing the freeway in the 70s was just the first step to our reclaiming that natural feature and making it the center of our city and also bringing nature into our city. So while we're densifying our city and adding many, many more people, especially over the next few decades, we are also incorporating nature right in into the center, recapturing it, really. And here's a view looking from the east side to the west side across the steel bridge where uh, we have reclaimed a little strip of land next to one of our freeways that we haven't yet been able to tear down, the East Bank Freeway. But inspired by success on the west side, we have been able to at least capture a, um, a bit of this land here. And this is a major commuting route in and out of downtown, and we have a lower uh, bridge crossing for bicycles here. And I'll just leave you with uh, a few more, a little bit more about what's in the blue book. We, there are seven principles, which I've gone over some of those, and then there are six key characteristics. And they, I'll just summarize them quickly. We talk about how street networks maximize connectivity, which is good for removing freeways, and it's good for transit working. Uh, it also creates desirable places where multiple networks overlap, so you can help people get that last mile if you provide a good network where that um, bike share, say, is at the end of the transit line and somebody can actually get to their workplace. Uh, we acknowledge that street networks are inherently complex and not the flat dendritic system 
that we've been using for the last post-war period. And major streets are not something to be afraid of. They should be well designed. They can be the great streets of the community. Also, all streets are safe and walkable. In a, in a central city, in an urban area, there shouldn't be any that are sacrificed for automobility. And finally, we provide the network provides a wide range of street types, each with a role in the network. So I believe that we're going to uh, have Eric present and then take questions. So thank you very much. And for more information about this, please, uh, and to uh, see a bit, an issue version of the Blue Book, you can go to cnu.org. Thank you. Here we go. Am I here? Can you hear me? Excellent. All right, I am Eric Dumba. I am the director of the School of Urban and Regional Planning at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, and what I was asked to do is to talk about some of the technical aspects of getting these things pulled down. Now, my background is uh, I'm trained as a traffic engineer. Uh, and I'm acquainted with the tools and techniques we use to get things done. Um, and I did some work on a project in New Orleans that CNU was pushing for to try to get them to tear down a highway that runs through the Treme district. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start by talking about some common arguments you'll hear um, against the, the removal of freeways. Uh, and then I'm going to proceed to talk about some of the technical tools you can use to justify the freeway elimination. Uh, so that's going to be the two, the two legs of my talk. Now, the first, the first time you, when you start talking about freeway elimination, somebody's going to say, uh, if you eliminate that freeway, it's going to create traffic congestion. And that's bad because it's going to undermine the local economy. People will run away. People will spend their time stuck in traffic. The economy will collapse, and your region will fail. Um, now, the basis for this uh, comes from work uh, in a former life. I worked with the Texas Transportation Institute, which many of you may know. Uh, for who may know, producing the annual mobility report, which ranks the amount of delay that different metropolitan areas experience, uh, and then quantifies that in terms of dollar amounts, so the cost per driver of that delay in terms of wasted fuel and in terms of lost time. And what this does is it makes our, our major metropolitan areas look like awful places, right? What we see here, this is from a few years ago, we see Chicago. Uh, experiences seven, 70 hours a day, which costs drivers uh, $1,738 per year in lost fuel and time. Now, this makes this city look awful. It suggests that if we could eliminate this delay, we would take that money and we would circulate that back into our economy and our, our metro economy and our metropolitan areas would be healthy and wealthy and, and successful. But this is a misleading assertion. It assumes that you measure economies in terms of fuel uh, in people's time, but those are actually inputs into an economy. The output of an economy is its gross domestic product, which is the dollar value of the goods and services it produces. So what I did as a researcher is I wanted to see if it was true that congestion hurts the economy. So what I did was I ran a regression to analyze gross domestic product per capita for metropolitan areas against its congestion. And what I found was that for every 10% increase in per capita vehicle delay, a region's per capita gross domestic product didn't drop. It actually increased by 3.4%. Now, to state this another way, what this means is that as, it, as, as metropolitan areas become more congested, they also become wealthier. That something about sitting in traffic makes people increasingly more and more productive. Um, now, I'm kidding, of course. That's not true. Uh, what it says is that and where I think most of you will agree that traffic is actually part of the characteristic 
of a successful city. That as places become more wealthy, people are, have higher rates of employment, they're making more money, they've got more jobs, they're producing more goods, and all of that results in more travel. Travel to deliver goods to market, travel to get people to work, these people are travel making more money, so they have money for shopping and for recreational purposes, all of which produces a lot of travel. Now we also tend to assume that traffic congestion is something associated with automobiles, and that's not true either. Traffic congestion has existed as long as cities have existed. Uh, so in the case of Rome, uh, Imperial Rome had traffic congestion to the point that Julius Caesar wound up banning horse carts during Rome during the day because it prevented people from engaging in the activities at the Roman Forum. So construction activities as a result were shifted until night. Now this is, as far as I'm aware, the first travel demand management strategy in world history. And it happened uh, 1990 so years before there were ever in automobiles. So traffic congestion is part of having a city. It's not something that's necessarily bad. It's an artifact of economic activity. The question then becomes not how do we move cars more efficiently, but how we move people and goods. The second thing that you'll hear is that, okay, well, limiting freeways is going to create gridlock, if nothing else, that the traffic problems we have will be exacerbated by the removal of a freeway. Now, I know John Norquist has talked quite a lot about the examples of freeway teardowns, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this today, but what I'm going to do is highlight a couple different points um, to illustrate the fact. So first, there's been a good deal of work on freeway eliminations. There's a study that was done by University College of London uh, that looked at 63 case studies worldwide, and what they found was that after a project had been eliminated or capacity had been reduced in some way, that the average amount of traffic reduction that occurred was 26%. Both, they looked at both the roadways that were reduced as well as the adjacent road network. So 26% of that traffic just disappeared after a, a freeway elimination or a roadway uh, lane closure. Uh, it just disappeared. It couldn't be found on the new street nor on the surrounding network. Now the median, because some of them, you know, the median is sometimes a better measure of the central tendency rather than the mean because an outlier can drive the average up. The median was 11%. So stated another way, typically uh, a lane reduction project or a freeway elimination project resulted in 11% reduction in traffic. And I put the link to this article here if you guys want to see that. It's a good summary of the state of the knowledge on disappearing traffic. We also have quite a bit of experience uh, in the United States with these things, in Portland and a number of others. Uh, and what we see on average is about 15% of that traffic, 15 to 25%, depending on the project, disappearing. And by disappearing, I mean you don't see it on the existing roadway and you don't see it on the adjacent streets to which that would have uh, rerouted. What happens is the people make different choices, they shift modes, they change their trip. The traffic just disappears. Now, a project to illustrate why this is, is one that was done by uh, the firm Gladding Jackson in Chattanooga. This is Chattanooga Riverfront Park, Nuga. Uh, it was a four-lane roadway that ran along the waterfront, separated the waterfront from the city. And what they had was they had a capacity problem uh, during the AM peak period as people were traveling into downtown for work. Uh, the first intersection where that this roadway unloads would back up, and then it would generate a queue that extended along the entire roadway. And what you see here with each of these orange dots is a choke point in the network. And at the, the high point there was carrying about 2,000 vehicles per hour during the peak period, a little further down, 1,758. But to state it another way, the problem was is one intersection failed, everything backed up along the roadway failed. So uh, they looked at a, different solutions for this, and what they proposed was not one that on the surface would seem like an intuitive solution. They proposed converting this four-lane limited access road to a two-lane urban street. Now how they did that was they recognized that traffic problems in cities are not problems of flow, but of distribution. That within cities, people aren't trying to unload at one point. They have a lot of micro destinations throughout that network. And the most effective way to eliminate that is to um, is to allow people to route directly where they need to go. So to provide them more access points to enter into the grid. And that's exactly what the solution here was that they proposed. So what we see here is a bunch of additional points punched in a bunch of holes punched into that road network, allowing people to distribute more freely throughout the road network uh, in Chattanooga. And what you're seeing up here are the volumes after the fact. The volumes dropped 
uh, by about half on most instances, because people were allowed to filter into the network. And by dropping volumes down to that level, that gave them the flexibility to take the lanes out. And here it is uh, after it's completed. What we've got is a nice urban two-lane roadway that connects the city back up with the waterfront with its aquarium. And there's a nice little park off in the distance that you can't see there that now allows people to directly, directly engage the water in their city. And the lesson to take from this, and this is one that undoubtedly people have told you on previous webinars, is that connected street networks move traffic more efficiently by distributing over larger areas. The urban traffic problem is a problem of trying to force all of the traffic onto a handful of points. The analogy is like taking a lot of water and, and pushing it into a funnel. And then as it reaches, it reaches the neck of the funnel, it starts backing up. But if you can distribute that water across the network, those choke points don't exist. Now, the second case that you've almost certainly heard of at some point before is the case of San Francisco Central Freeway. This was a uh, multi-deck facility that, as a result of the Loma Prieta earthquake, uh, was structurally unsound. And they proposed, after the earthquake, to make it more um, resilient to earthquake. They needed to reconstruct it. And it created a lot of concern, because to reconstruct it, they had to close it down. And what you see here is a news item in 1996 that's typical of these types of projects that the plans to close this freeway looks like it's going to be a disaster. People think of moving away. The merchants are frightened. Right? The closure of this is going to create traffic catastrophe in the surrounding area. But they closed it, and something amazing happened. Traffic planners were baffled by success. No central freeway, no gridlock, and no explanation. Um, and this is typical of these kinds of projects, because people do what people can be reasonably expected to do, that when given an existing condition, they adapt their behavior to it. Traffic is not like water. Traffic is not a physical system that has to be carried, uh, given whatever volume it is. It's a social system that's filled with intelligent people making choices about how to travel. So that is the logic behind a lot of these things. And here it is before. Let me go through. Here's the after. Yeah, I go fast. So if I'm going too fast, guys, let me know. I see Tim's, Tim's comment. I can try to slow it down a little bit. Uh, and the traffic effects afterwards, it carried 76,000 vehicles per day before. It carried 44,489 after. In other words, the traffic dropped by about half through this. Now, the interesting thing, too, is that uh, this, this roadway, the revised roadway, only goes up about four or five blocks before it terminates. All of that traffic is able to diffuse into the network after a few intersections. All right. Now, here's what I think you guys are interested in, which is how to advocate for one of these freeway teardowns. You've got one in your community, and you need to know how to deal with that, how to push it forward. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is my experience uh, looking at New Orleans Claiborne Expressway. And I will say at the outset that this is one that I don't know is going to be successful, but we certainly put in a good fight on this one. But I'll show you, and politics ultimately got into this, but I'll show you how you go about this and talk about the tools and tricks you need um, to advocate for it. So and another way to state this is how to use the traffic engineer's models uh, to your own benefit. Now first, I should also state that I'm an agnostic when it comes to travel demand models. And I'll give you an example why here. You guys are almost certainly familiar with this graphic that shows, can we prove? I'll get to the question a little bit. Uh, that you're familiar that this shows that the MT goes down, has gone down over the last eight, eight or 10 years or so. That we've got declining DMT. This is observable fact. Our models that we use are not very good at dealing with social changes like this. Models themselves are stupid. What they do is they try to extrapolate data points from the past extend the line forward to predict the future. And what it says to us is that the future must be an extension of the past, that what we saw in the past will reasonably predict the future. Now, that doesn't reasonably account for social changes, changes in social preference, changes in, in needs, and the like. And so what we've seen, and I think you'll like this graphic if you haven't seen it before, this was put together, my friends, at the State Surface Transportation Institute. It shows that same graphic, the black line, shows you the decline in VMT over time, and then it shows you the US DOT's projections of what traffic's expected to do. So all throughout this period of declining, de declining traffic, what we see is them just continuing to carry the traffic line forward. Right? 
if all you got is a hammer, all your tools are going to look like nails. That's the reality of the traffic models. They're very good at making you do everything that you've done in the past, and they don't do a very good job of telling you what the future is going to look like if needs, preferences, and values change. And we're at a point, socially, where our needs, preferences, and values are changing because of things like global climate change, because of our renewed interest in urbanization, and the like. All right, so with that preference, what I want to talk about is a project uh, in New Orleans. This is I-10 Claiborne. Uh, I don't know. Let me see if I can draw this here. Somehow I'll highlight this for you. Give me a second here. Where's the drawing tool? And maybe I just don't do that. All right. I reckon I just can't do that. Right? Is that it? No. Draw. There we go. This, this is what I want. Color. So here's what's going on here. You've got this is central New Orleans. There's a roadway that runs right through here where I'm drawing the line. That right, if y'all are familiar with the TV show The Treme, that's where The Treme is. Uh, you've got the French Quarter here. This area is The Treme. Uh, it's in a, primarily, it's historically an African American district that was once characterized by a broad, they call it a median ground, but a broad boulevard with a green, green central uh, median. There was the center of, of life and activity there. Uh, and in the 1960s, to address projected traffic demand, in New Orleans, they built this roadway right here. They put it over the over Claiborne Avenue. They put it in an elevated freeway that was connecting up 90 there with uh, I-10 to the north. So that's the context of this. It's about four mile length of the roadway, and that's what I'll be talking about here. A great candidate, and it's been for a couple of years on CNUs on Norquist's uh, freeways without a future list. All right, so the strategy about going forward with one of these projects, first what you need to do, and I imagine anybody that is on this webinar is already good at this portion of it, the first is you need to establish the moral purpose for this project. What is the reason to do this? Why is this important? Who does this matter to? And with that group, you build your political coalition. You need to find people, stakeholders, who have a political voice that can force this onto the local agenda. That's the first thing you need to do. Right. And with Claiborne, it was pretty easy to do that. You can see here on the left, uh, Claiborne Avenue as it was before, with the large, large boulevard. And you can see in an African-American Main Street district that runs through it. And then on the right, the freeway that came through and completely wiped out that community and created what we have today, which is an impoverished uh, community. And for blocks radiating around that, that freeway, absolute blight. All right. So the moral purpose for that one is that it's a, it was an injustice perpetrated on the city. The second, though, is you also need to make the case that the freeway is unnecessary or that there's a good reason to get rid of it. The ones that typically come up, certainly John Norquist in Milwaukee has made this argument, the first is structural deterioration. These things are often built in the 50s and 60s, and they were designed with a 50-year functional life. And after that point, they start to deteriorate, um, some more than others. The second is that the facility itself is underperforming. That the roadway, and this is the case of San Francisco, uh, and the Embarcadero, and these sorts of roadways, that they're underperforming. That they never carried the traffic volumes they were expected to carry. That they're a stub of a part of a larger system that will never get built. And they're not doing what they were intended to do. Another argument that can capture people is the social justice argument. Because lower income communities were often great candidates, for these types of roadways because land costs were low and because they tended not to vote or be enfranchised in the 60s, uh, a lot of these went into areas where uh, the population was disadvantaged. So there's a social justice argument to be made, one to right wrong. The second is an argument, or the fourth rather, is an argument about urban blight. That um, the roadway, as these things are wont to do, create what Jane Jacobs calls a border vacuum and generates blight on either side of it. So it kills off the light, life on either side. And then finally, to get your development community in, is that they're a barrier to redevelopment. And certainly in our cities, with the renewed interests in them, particularly from the development community, this is how you get these folks to come on board and support the freeway elimination. Because you're opening up a lot of what is typically low-cost land for redevelopment. Um, so those are some of the cases you can make to build your coalition and to go argue 
uh, for these things over time. But again, you all have your histories with these roadways, and you all undoubtedly are familiar with the things that make this important for your communities. The next question, then, is how we go forward and get uh, the various engineers, elected officials, and the like to support it, how we play with the data. Right? So making the case, in the case of Claiborne, what we did is we showed that the link itself was relatively irrelevant. Now, interstate highways such as this are intended to carry traffic across the country. But if you are of goods movement and you're traveling across the country, you have no reason to go down to New Orleans. Reasonable folks will continue along I-10, go hit 12, which is actually a, intended as a bypass route, and then come down along 10. And that total distance is 85 miles versus 108 if folks stay on I-10. So no reasonable person traveling across the country is going to add that extra 20-some miles on there. It makes no sense. And then the bypass itself, here's where I-10 goes, and it comes up along Pontchartrain and then back up. That little dot that I went through, that minuscule dot down there, is what this roadway is as part of the larger interstate highway network. As part of the broader system, it's nearly irrelevant. So it doesn't make sense in terms of interstate goods movement. Now the question becomes, what does it make in terms, what's its purpose in terms of local movement? Now anybody traveling trying to bypass New Orleans has no reason to go down it either for the same reason. If you want to bypass New Orleans from the north, you come this way. Likewise, if you're coming from the south and you're heading west, you have absolutely no reason to take this little nub of Claiborne either. This is the alignment that you would take. The only movement that matters is this movement. We're going to color this one. Let's color this one green. Right. The only movement that matters is folks from the East New Orleans trying to head south and bypass downtown to hit Gretna. And here's the critical movement politically. Make this one red again. It's you've got your your port down here. You have your industrial canal where they store goods here, and you've got a lot of goods movement running this way. Those are really the two movements that matter. So that's the context of it. So the challenge then, most of folks that need this roadway, and the value with this roadway, if you look down to it, the average trip on, on this roadway is only about a mile and a half. To, to put this in another context, people are treating this for an off-ramp to get up to I-10. It's not particularly meaningful for the local area. Folks that are in here simply want to get to the street network, just like we saw in Chattanooga. Um, so the critical point on this roadway, then, is the one right here. We'll fill that in a little bit. That's where the freight, freight and goods movement heading out east goes, and that's where the folks coming from East New Orleans down through Gretna need to go. So that's the critical point in this network. All right. So that's the argument you make, that it's not a particularly relevant road. Now, here's what you all want to know. How do, you, how do you get this thing promoted? The fight you're going to have with your engineers is going to be over two things. It's going to be over the, the number of vehicles that need to travel on the roadway in the future, and then the amount of time that it's going to take uh, these people to travel along the corridor in the revised condition. So the first thing we want to do is we want to argue for the lowest possible baseline traffic volumes. How many vehicles do we need this roadway to carry? Now, you're going to get a lot of fight over making this because this isn't science. As we've seen with the VMT models, this is at best junk science, and at worst, it's a complete, well, it's a semi-educated guess. So what we need to do is make the case for the lowest defensible baseline volumes. We need to argue for, and to get the volumes down, and I'll explain all these in a second. So lowest defensible baseline volumes, argue for a 50-50 directional split, so an even distribution of traffic, and I'll show you why that's important in a second. And then you conduct something called a select links analysis, which looks at how that traffic is going to redistribute over the surrounding network. And I'll show you an example of each of these in just a second. All right, so, that, so when I go through these next slides so you know exactly what I'm arguing for, these are different tricks you can use to get the baseline traffic volume down as low as possible. Now first, Here's how I, I did this when I looked at New Orleans. I needed to make a defensible value to, to start with. And what I did, as I showed you before, is I picked that link up in the north northeast quadrant. Oops, 
There we go, I'll draw around that. The northeast quadrant. And what you see here are the traffic volumes before and after Katrina, because there was a huge exodus from the city following Katrina. So prior to Katrina, uh, this uh, section of I-10 Claiborne was carrying 82,569 vehicles per day. After Katrina in 2008, uh, which was the data I used for this, uh, 51,309. So traffic volumes had dropped by about 51,000. Uh, now I want to show you the trick I'm doing here because I'm kind of, I don't want to say I'm pulling a fast one, but the point is that when you argue for numbers, you have to argue for the greatest defensible number. So the highest number through here is this one right here. 69,466 vehicles per day, 91,600. Now why I don't think this number is important, the argument I would make for that, is that when we look at the distribution of travel on this roadway, most of the folks in the center of the roadway are simply trying to get on and off I-10. They're not trying to travel the length of it. So that link in and of itself is simply reflective of all of the people trying to access the grid, not of the actual through moving traffic that needs to be on it. So I'm arguing, I'm making the case, Right? And this is all, this is all argument. And done. this is exactly what your traffic engineer is going to do. There's no good reason why this number is better than that one in terms of being higher. So argue for the number, the lowest defensible number, and I would assert that 51,309 is it. So try to get folks to agree on that one. Now in reality, to understand why this project went awry, as we went forward with the planning for this, the MPO wanted us to carry 110 thousand vehicles per day. They didn't care at all, but that's, that's the politics of the place. The second thing you want to do is you want to look at the directional distribution of traffic. Now, presuming we're carrying 53,000 vehicles per day, um, that doesn't mean we have to carry them all in one direction. Right? Trying to carry 53,000 vehicles per day in a single direction is going to result in enormous lane, an enormous roadway. The reality is that those lanes are going, those, those those trips are going in two directions. Some are heading north and some are heading south. Now what you want to do is you want it to get those numbers down. Again, all we're trying to do here is not figure out the quote-unquote truth, but to come up with the most defensible volume for getting this thing torn down. What you do is argue for something called a 50-50 directional split. That says half the traffic is going one way and half the traffic is going the other. So that the number of lanes you need is only half of the total volume. So assuming we've got, let me just do a quick, 53,000 vehicles per day here, you're looking at about plus or minus 27,000 in each direction. Um, normally roadways have a less than a 50-50 split. There's something like a 60-40, which means you're going to have to design for a higher number, probably something like uh, 33,000 would be my guess, just off the top of my head. But argue for the 50-50 split, you can do that. And you can look at from your travel models, and this is what I'm showing here, you can look at where that traffic goes and how much of it is, is carrying on through. Right? And that will give you the justification for figuring out if you can use a 50-50. And there's a lot of different arguments you can use to do that, the punchline of which is it helps you drive that baseline traffic volume down. All right. The other thing that CNU is very big on is the fact that there is a surrounding network that we can leverage for these trips. As we've seen in other areas, when you eliminate a roadway, some of those trips redistribute to other parts of the network. And indeed in cities, many of those trips don't have any interest in being on the major freeway at all. All they're trying to do is get onto the street network and they back up where those locations are. And it's true here too, in New Orleans what we see are some of the parallel routes that could carry the traffic that otherwise would have gone on Claiborne Avenue. Again, Claiborne's here. There's Rampart Street, the edge of the French Quarter, and other routes that we can leverage as well. All right, and you can see here, here's some of the traffic volumes. Some of the, one of the major roadways here, pre-Katrina, was carrying about 40,000, 43,000 vehicles per day, carrying about 23,000 more, or 23,000 after Katrina. So it's already got an excess capacity of 20,000 vehicles. So you can distribute those vehicles onto there. That's the network. Now what you have to do, if you want to play the engineering game, is you need, to, you need to show that this traffic is going to redistribute itself across the network. And the tool we use to do that is something called TransCAD. And here's a picture of Marcy's network in Portland on the bottom right. This is a transportation planning software that allows you to screw around with the traffic volumes on one, way, one roadway, and it will try to redistribute those trips on another. And you do that using a technique called select links analysis. So if I were to take uh, Marcy's freeway down around here, 
it's not a freeway anymore, and now it's a roadway, and take a couple lanes out of it, I could then see it would then remodel all of those trips throughout the network. What it's trying to seek is an equilibrium point for all of the traffic volumes on that roadway. So if you pull some capacity off, how is it going to redistribute itself? This, too, is not hard science. It's a, what a colleague of mine calls a wag or a wild-ass guess. Uh, and that's actually the guy who does the mobility reports in Lomax. But it's a wild guess. But it's still defensible. Like all of these models, find a defensible thing to use. This allows you to see what happens when you take trips off of this. It'll show you how they distribute throughout the network. That's how you make the case, particularly when you've got excess capacity in the surrounding street, that there won't be traffic chaos. Because this is simply going to try to find the best way to the best and most efficient way to redistribute all those trips throughout the network. And if you've got capacity, you shouldn't see any problem at all. And most of our urban street networks have capacity. Okay, so select link analysis. When you're arguing for this, make sure you have your, your transportation consultant run that uh, for the after condition, because that's going to show you where that traffic goes and help you make your case. And I don't know where this slide is. Oh, here we go. Here's one that I think is going to cause some of my pedestrian friends a lot of heartache, but just bear with me for a second. So once we've got our volumes down as low as possible along that corridor, what we now need to do is redesign the corridor to maximize its throughput. And what that means is we want to adjust those signal cycles, at least in the planning stage, to be as efficient as possible for moving cars. And what you do for that, now let me take a step back and explain how traffic signals work. Traffic signals have uh, there's uh, time associated with the traffic signal, so there's a certain amount of time and space. And what this does is allocate time towards specific movements. So the more time you allocate to the primary movement, that, that is, the, in this case, the, the roadway that's going to replace the freeway, the more efficient that traffic's going to go. Now, you can also adjust the duration of the signal cycle. Uh, NACTO and URBAN is like 60-second signal cycles because it allows pedestrians to get the green pretty quickly uh, and cross the street and it encourages them to avoid jaywalking. Now, from an engineering side, when we're interested in maximizing throughput, we like really, really long signal cycles, which is why you guys, when you walk in your suburban areas, spend all that time waiting for the pedestrian signal. We like them really long because we want to minimize something called startup lag, which is the wasted time at each green light before vehicles can go. We also want to reduce the number of left turns because it takes an incredible amount of time compared to going through for those left turning vehicles to get through the intersection. They have to travel a greater distance through the intersection. All of that is wasted time. So what we do is when we're concerned about expediting traffic is we argue for long signal lengths, those three minute ones, which means you only have to deal with the left turn in each direction once every three minutes. All right, the pedestrian can wait. Once every three minutes, you've got your startup lag. Once every three minutes, you've got your left turn delay. And the rest of the time, that thing can move pretty efficiently. Um, now, for those of you who are, are saying, wait a minute, we're trying to design this for pedestrians. If we do our signals like this, uh, aren't we undermining our cause? I say, don't worry about that. And I'll tell you why. Because you need to argue to get this freeway torn down. And once you get the damn thing torn down, they're not going to rebuild it. Then you can come back and play around with your signal cycles and get what you want. And if these things work like they should, what you'll see is all the development and pedestrians in the area are going to create the need to adjust your signal cycles back. In fact, the reality is, is once the thing's torn down, you can, you can do whatever signal cycle you want. All I'm arguing for is how to optimize this thing so that it's defensible for folks who want to tear it down. So you go for the long signal lengths, and I'll show you how that works in a second, and then you argue to minimize those left turn volumes. So the more trips you can get not making left turns, the better. And in this case, things like one-way streets, which we also hate, are your friends here. Because you can eliminate all those left turns by forcing vehicles to make three right turns and then go around to the adjacent intersection. All right? I'm not telling you this is the best way for a city. What I'm telling you is that this is the best way to get the numbers you need to support tearing down a freeway. And so I did an analysis of this for uh, Claiborne. What I did is I used the 53,000 vehicles per day that I showed you before. I assumed a 60-40 directional split, so 60 going in the peak direction, 40 going in the off-peak direction. Um, I assumed a signal length, because I could, of 120 seconds. 60 is what I would like for an urban street, but twice that 120 
to get through movement or to get that longer signal cycle. Um, I allocated 58% of that time to the, the main direction. So the bulk of the time to the main direction. I made assumptions about, let me see here, assumptions about left turns. I assumed only 12% left turns, so I didn't have a huge amount to deal with. I put in ridiculously long left turn storage lengths. These are your left turn lanes. The more vehicles you can get into that left turn lane, the more you can cycle through on the, the left turn. And it also moves those vehicles out of the way from the through lane, so it makes it more efficient. Another thing you can play with if you want to do, oh, here's the AADT, so the traffic volumes, 51309. Another thing you can play with to adjust your level of service is your free flow speed. If you assume lower free flow speeds, any reduction in speed, um, say it goes from 60 to 20, it's going to be 40 miles per hour reduction, but if you go from 50 to 20, it's only 30. So that's how you argue for that. So you can play with that input value as well. Flow rate, traffic control delay, and what this produces is the expected speed, which is then calculated or converted into the automobile level of service. And what this says here is that as a result of tearing down that freeway and converting into a seven-lane surface boulevard, level of service during the peak period is going to be C, which as we know is pretty doggone good. What this argues for, what this suggests, is that we can tear this thing down without any particularly significant impact. And the, the through flow speed is 21 miles per hour on average. Now, to, to highlight some problems here, not every intersection is perfect. So a lot of these intersections aren't doing particularly great, particularly Canal Street is not doing particularly hot where they all unload off of there. But on the whole, level of service C and an auto speed of 21 miles an hour is defensible. Now, the other thing you need to be careful about is how you present this thing. So what we care about, again, are speeds and delay. So what we see here, 60 miles per hour is the free flow speed, which means they can travel this uh, four mile, a little over four mile quarter in about 2.2 minutes. Now with the uh, congested condition, with the elimination, they're going to move an average of 21 miles per hour, which is 6.25 minutes. Now there are two ways to present this information, one that helps you make the case and one that undermines it. The first is, and the one the press will immediately seize on, is, oh my god, if you tear this roadway down, there's going to be a 200% increase in vehicle delay along the corridor. It's going to go from taking two minutes to travel to taking six minutes to travel through. How awful is that? You need to cut this off by presenting this information in a way that's more politically palatable, which I would suggest is this way. Even if we tear this thing down, you're only going to see a four-minute increase in travel times through the corridor during the most congested period. And in return for that increase, what we're seeing is a revitalization of the surrounding area, the renewal of the treme, and the correction of a social injustice. Is that worth four minutes of people's time during the peak 15 minutes each day? And it's hard to say that that's not true. Right? So that's the way you justify it. For the cost of four minutes, 15 four minute travel times, 15 minutes a day, what we wind up doing is righting a wrong and improving our city. Don't we love our city enough to do that? All right, and then you can, this is just me, I present it to them, it's not so important for here. Different ways that I was playing around with this. So what if we decrease the traffic like 50% through the network reallocation like we see in most cities? It gets the auto speed to 27 miles per hour and the auto level of service of B, which as you know, B is wonderful. It's very rare that we get level of service B during the peak period. So if we do that, we can actually drop this thing down to a five-lane urban avenue and still have a really wonderful roadway. So theoretically, you could run this thing as a five-lane urban avenue with these numbers. All right. So a summary to get to my punchline here. What you want to do, the four steps is first, establish your moral purpose and political coalition. You need your champions. Second, make the public case that the freeway is not needed. Then you play around with methodological techniques to get reductions in demand. And then finally, the signal tricks I showed you, do that to max maximize the throughput through the corridor to reduce the travel times on the distance. Technically, this is how you do that. This is how you get the numbers that can get people behind you. And all this will be up so you can have that before. I also want to put my contact information up. Um, in case you guys have a project you're after and you want some help with it, I'd be glad to, uh, to do that. And incidentally, John Norquist will be joining us here down at FAU in a few months. Uh, so we're going to be a freeway elimination powerhouse. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back over to Tim.
Well, actually, I'll be joining you right now, Eric. Awesome. <laughs> Here. Um, and we'll try to get Marcy up. So well. if Marcy can get on as well. We have uh, some questions. And I'm going to have. I'm going to read the questions. Sure. I'm going to have Ed McMahon. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, Alex McCaig, read these questions. So we just had a few questions. I know we're a little bit over time, so if you, if others have to leave, we can uh, feel free to drop out. But um, we can also have folks stick around and, and answer some questions. But we've got one. I think maybe Marcy, we can go to you first. Uh, the question is: How is functional classification incompatible with street network legibility and terminated vistas? Did you hear the question? Oh, is she turned on? All right, I think we had some sound problems there. Eric, could you hear Marcy? Uh, I can't hear her, no. She's moving, so she's definitely doing something. Yeah, OK, we were lip reading. But uh, Alex is working on that. He's going to try to. All right, so Eric, you want to try to answer that question about functional classification? Uh, it was, why is it incompatible with terminated vistas? Is that right? Read well, it again. And, and, I got to get my glasses. And incompatibility with uh, street street network legibility. Um, this is really an area of Marcy's expertise. I would I would be giving you a poor, an inferior good if I answered that. So I'm going to maybe leave that one for Marcy. All right. Then we're going to ask you the next question while we're working on Marcy's. Uh, Marcy, turn. No, nope, I think we got her. Oh, okay. You got her. Okay, you're on, Marcy. Go for it. All right. All right, so the question's been stated a few times now, so I'll try to answer it. <laughs> uh, when a good street Monfi is actually two cities. They were designed during the city beautiful movement of the 1920s, so they have this lovely radial street system that connects the train station to the Central Park, or uh, provides a view of the river to the mountain. And these streets were designed specifically to make that visual and physical connection. And then uh, during the functional classification period, during the advent of that um, kind of use of streets where we were pr promoting mostly automobility into downtowns, all of the design of those streets, some of them were boulevards, some of them had parkways in the middle, some of them had special design. They were all the great streets of Kelso Longview. They were all turned into arterials. And their, freeway, their uh, auto numbers were intended to be maximized. And so the medians came out, the sidewalks got narrower, uh, and there's nothing left that distinguishes them one from another. So when I say that functional classification is a, sort of antithetical to the idea of these streets that have identities, that's what I'm talking about. It has negative impacts on the value of the neighborhood and the ability of people to walk and all the other things that we care about. Right. Functional classification tends to make all the streets that are called arterials look the same. You will not know whether you're in an arterial in New Orleans, or an arterial in Portland, or an arterial in Kelso Longview. They all look the same. They tend to be developed the same with a lot of signage and utility poles. And so that if there were any view at the end of that corridor, you would never be able to see it anyway. OK. And I, I want to ask a question here, and either one of you can answer it. Uh, Alex and I, and Ken Voigt, who's a uh, former uh, chair or president, as they call it, of uh, ITE. Uh, and Ken's a traffic engineer and a member of the board of CNU. 
we went to Schaumburg a few days ago to meet with the Illinois DOT and three of the district uh, leaders and their staff. And the ones from District 1 showed us Willow Road in Chicago. And they went down to 10-foot wide lanes. And they ended up loving it. They haven't built it yet, but they've designed it, and it's about to be built. And I was so encouraged. These were traffic engineers from the Illinois DOT who fell in love with 10-foot lanes. And I find this wildly encouraging. They were so proud of it. We didn't need to tell them it was good. They already knew it. And one of the guys who did it a year ago had told us 10-foot lanes wouldn't work. And here they haven't even built it yet, and they're enthusiastic about it. I thought that was a huge breakthrough. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> so we're going to have to take pictures think that's great. of Willow Road when it's done and spread them all over the Internet. All right. Now we had one other question. Um, do any models yeah. account for the fact that some traffic simply disappears when a link is removed? I think you mentioned that while you were talking, Eric. That is, people change their travel habits. Well, you said they disappeared, but, you know, if you just say they disappeared, people find that hard to believe. What does actually happen? Can you account for all of it, or is it just a mystery? It's sort of like, you know, people, when they talk about religion, they end up defending it, saying it's a mystery. So is it more than a mystery? Do you have the answer? Yeah, that's what you... That's what you... C is complete speculation about it. There's not been any good case. You, the only way I think you could do that is to do some survey of people who used the route before and after. It would be tricky and it would be expensive. We just make guesses. Um, but what I did with my models is I didn't assume any disappeared because people don't believe you. Um, so the baseline model I did, I, um, I just tried to move the traffic that was there. And then I did a second one that said, if they move, how okay, low can we go? Can we prove less so that's how I That's how I did the models. When we go from highways to boulevards? I mean, we know that death on highways is a function of speed and alcohol, that most of the deaths tend to be uh, when traffic's going so fast that if people crash, they die. But are there definitive studies that uh, people that are interested in this issue in their hometown can easily access? I... Definitive studies is really something I would have to turn over to Eric here. But I can say that in Portland, when that freeway came down, there had been a number of fatalities on it that were discussed during the whole uh, discussion of demolition. And those went away. But I can't, um, when that street was absorbed as a, as a street into the network, when the freeway was torn down, I'm not sure I can say whether there were can continue to be fatalities at the same uh, in the same amount after that or not. All right, Eric, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I do. It's actually a tough argument to make because on a per mile traveled basis, interstates are safer, limited access freeways are safer than surface streets. Um, so the way you're going to have to do that is make a case that the surface street is safe, a case that the surface street is safe, that you're bringing in principles of safety engineering. And you would hinge that on the speed argument, on traffic conflicts, and ideally on models of other streets that perform well. Um, but you always want to look at the baseline condition for the street you're looking on. Uh, Claiborne is actually a very, very dangerous roadway, not on the elevated section, but at the ground level where all of that merges in. Your off ramps are always incredibly. They're always the most dangerous places in now, a city. When, so when, don't look at the the trunk line, the main one. Look at the adjacent ramps where it connects. That's going to be a bloodbath. So if you look at that, you've got some advantage. Is dangerous. Um, but you'd have to look at it at the local We've context. We've sometimes been able to refute that. So that's the kind of a non-answer. The Indiana Expressway in uh, Illinois and in Indiana, uh, particularly the Illinois DOT, they made an argument that it would relieve congestion on I-80, and that I-80 uh, was dangerous because it was congested. And then we looked at their data and found that all of the death over the three-year period that they had cited had happened in off-peak hours. And so it wasn't, by that measurement, wasn't a function of, of congestion. 
uh, it was a function of speed and alcohol because they were concentrated at bar closing times. Um, and so therefore, relieving congestion on I-80, there might be lots of reasons to do it, but one of them wasn't to reduce death. So, uh, okay, so we have, uh, we have time for any more oh, questions? We, no, I we are over time. We're over time. All right. So we've had people listening from all yeah. over the country who are involved in the freeway issue. There's some people from Detroit on that uh, want to see the Chrysler Expressway, which go, crashes into the beautiful Jefferson uh, corridor in uh, Detroit, which carries uh, traffic from... Uh, downtown Detroit to the Gross Point, and the freeway uh, crashes into it and takes what was a beautiful boulevard and turns it into an interchange. And so that's about to change. Uh, it looks like the state of Michigan is going to go ahead with it. So I hope that our people from Detroit that were listening uh, appreciated the questions and answers. And we'll probably do a, uh, sometime we'll do a podcast uh, specifically I may not be doing it, but somebody at CNU will do a podcast about that uh, Jefferson uh, Chrysler Expressway interchange. Anyway, thanks, everybody, for uh, listening. This is CNU, and I'm here along with Alex McCaig, who will now uh, bring us to a uh, complete conclusion. Thank you to our guests, Marcy McAnally and Eric Dunbar. Okay. Yeah, I think John did it well. So thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, John, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we'll, be, we'll be back next month with another Highways to Boulevards webinar, um, and we'll let you know when that's going to take place. And this webinar sure, today will be posted online at cnu.org slash highways. Thank you both so much again, and look forward to seeing you. Thanks. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thank